Once again, for everybody joining us live online, I'm Roz Walensina. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the Library of Congress. And on behalf of the Librarian of Congress, welcome. We promise you a very fabulous evening tonight, and we want to thank our partners in crime here. They are the wonderful folks from Netflix. They're all with them outside, so they'll be, they'll be in shortly. So We also want to thank, of course, the members of Congress who are here tonight, especially the members of the Congressional LGBTQ Equality Caucus. We want to welcome Hill staffers who are here tonight. Hill staffers include the members of the LGBTQ Congressional Staff Association, the Senate Glass Caucus, and of course the library's very own LC Globe. And if you've looked around, we're surrounded by a lot of young people. The conversation tonight is about LGBTQ issues for young adults. So we're welcoming all the youth groups from the Washington DC area who've joined us here tonight from Georgetown to American to Smile to LAYC. You're all here tonight. Thank you for coming. So raise of hands. Which one of you is, this is your first time to the Library of Congress? Well, that's pretty good. Usually we have a, you know, two thirds of the audience raise their hands. So for most of you who've been here before, I'm hoping you've seen the beautiful building, what this is, but there's more to the Library of Congress and that beautiful ceiling than that main reading room. We're a whole lot more than books. What we're trying to do with the library now is to, you know, bust the treasure chest open. So you all know what the library has. We're more than that ceiling, we're more than books. We have the, you know, the collection of 23 presidents, which includes the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets during his assassination, George Washington's inaugural address in his handwriting, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg address. So there's a lot of treasures here at the library, but they're more than historical items. They're from cultural icons like Leonard Bernstein and Jonathan Larson to Rogers and Hammersteins. We have all their papers. So we're hoping that some of you out here right now will be inspired by what the library has and someday you'll be a future Leonard Bernstein or Jonathan Larson or maybe have your own show on Netflix. Which gives to my good segue here. Please welcome from Netflix, the Director of North American Public Policy, Ms. Corey Wright. Hi everyone, good night. Thank you for being here this evening. I'm Corey Wright. I lead Netflix's work in North America on public policy on behalf of Netflix and my team here in DC. We really appreciate you coming out this evening. Uh, I have a few thank yous of my own to make, so I hope you'll bear with me, but thank you to Roswell and his team at the Library of Congress for hosting us here. If you haven't had a chance yet to check out the amazing artifacts from the library's collection, they're right outside the theater when, when this is through. Thank you, of course, to the LGBTQ CSC, Globe, Glass for partnering with us. Uh, we're really, really happy to see such an amazing turnout tonight. Of course, to Jen out for the amazing acapella performance that was gorgeous. Uh, Uh, and, and last but never least to the members of Congress who are able to join us here this evening. We really appreciate your presence and, and your dedication to these important issues. Uh, at Netflix, we work really hard to provide a stage for the world's most compelling stories and storytellers so you can find something that engages you and speaks to you. We've all had that moment when we find that movie or that TV show that is just what you need just when you need it. For me, Queer Eye is kind of that show. It is so easy when you turn on your TV or you look at your phone to be overwhelmed by the negativity, but then just when you need it, the Fab Five remind you that a little understanding, a little compassion, and a French tuck can really help the world <laughs> be a whole lot better. So I work for Netflix. I am not supposed to have favorites, but if I did, Queer Eye would be one of them, and judging by the turnout tonight, uh, I suspect that a few of you feel the same way. So we really appreciate you having, here to, having you here tonight. I hope you enjoy the panel, and thanks again. All righty, I know you're getting sick of me, so it's time. 
um, for moderating tonight's discussion is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post. You also see him on MSNBC. So it's hard to believe it's been only a year since we've been introduced to the Fab Five, but since then we've learned to French tuck our shirts, remind ourselves to moisturize every day, but most importantly, to love ourselves more. We met everyday Americans become inspirations and heroes like Tom of Georgia, Mama Tammy of Gay, Georgia, Jess of Kansas, and the Jones Sisters of Missouri. Yes. And you have to admit this one. Through three seasons, we've all laughed and we've all cried. So please welcome to Washington and to the Library of Congress, the cast of Netflix's Queer Eye, Bobby Burke, Tan France, Anthony Porosky, Jonathan Vatness, and Jonathan Capehart. It was, I, and, and I, I have no video. I, I, it was too late. I was too late. You have all been introduced. I, I assume have been introduced. But in case, I'm Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post and MSNBC. And thank you very much to the Library of Congress for hosting this incredible gathering of these incredible men who have given us an incredible show. Uh, as you can see here, I have questions. Questions. We got answers. We Prepared. So, baby. But you know what? I'm going to put this aside oh, because I don't know if you know. Book. Well, kind of, because I don't know if you know this, but we ask the audience to submit questions. Oh. And so I'm going to, and I have them oh. right here. And so I'm going to ask the questions that have come from the audience. And the first one, and, and if you hear your name, it's almost like the price is right. If you hear your name, come on scream down. and everything, but not, no, no, no oh. coming on down. <laughs> no coming on down. Jonathan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I hate to be the buzzkill, but, um, but scream so we know where you, where you are and they know, thank you. It's always so good, thank you. <laughs> Sally Morgan. <laughs> Sally, <laughs> Sally Morgan is 12 years old. Hi, Sally. Oh, and hi, Sal Sally Morgan. I don't know why I just did that yeah, I don't face, know why it was but it was, <laughs> I'm really happy for you that you're 12. I look like I was sad, but it was We're more jealous. like a, oh, it's jealousy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I miss my youth. <laughs> so Sally Morgan, 12 years old, how can kids in school be more confident in themselves? There's a little heart next to it. Uh, P.S. It's pronounced squirrel. Liar! <laughs> Who? <laughs> She's 12. That's why I didn't strike you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. I think that so, is a gorgeous question. Jonathan, Bora. yes. Um, uh, gorgeous question. And I think that, um, I think confidence is so easily swayed by comparing your experience with other people's experiences and just comparison in general. And what is the most sure thing that you will ever have is your relationship with yourself. So as you proceed in your education and your life, it's the more you can love and accept yourself, the more other people's opinions and the goings-ons of the world won't rock your opinion of yourself so much. And then, honey, you're confident, you know? Because, like... <laughs> I, so, yeah, just really work on your relationship boom. with yourself. I just want to add to that that I think an education helps as well, and not only the education that you get in school, but in kind of leaning into things that you're passionate about and what your interests are and just learning how to nurture those, because the more you know about something, the less fearful you are of it and the more confidence, I think, in turn, you'll have in yourself. So whatever that is for you, whether it's music, art, history, whatever it is, and then find people who have similar passions so you can- What about math? You can be passionate about math. Don't forget math. <laughs> really? Yeah. Math? The jury's still out on math, but <laughs> all of the other things I think have pretty much been proven. So, yeah. <laughs> 
Can I ask something about the show before I go to the next uh, audience question? And that is, it seems as though you all have been friends forever. It does. The, the chemistry between all of you and Karamo, who, who is not here, all five of you feel like, well, at least binging on the show, it feels like I've been dropped into these well-formed relationships. How long did it take to really get to know each other? So uh, during casting, there was probably, what, around 40 when we all finally came in together. And the five of us within the first day, day and a half, all just kind of mm -hmm. found each other. Mm -hmm. And even before we were cast, we, we instantly felt a connection to each other, and I think the producers really saw that. So it was very natural for us to to be inquisitive about each other and learn more and to like each other because we just automatically liked each other. And then when you're catapulted into filming a show where you're together 24 seven, almost seven days a week, you spend more time, we've spent more time with each other than some people spend an entire lifetime with their best friend. Mm -hmm. You know, so we've learned so much about each other. Mm -hmm. The good, True. the bad, the pretty, the ugly, everything. And it's made us have this type of chemistry that you can't manufacture. Mm -hmm. Any of you have a pet peeve about the other? Tan, I'm sorry, I think I... No, 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 I was gonna... Tan, he was asking about... Uh, you, uh, Jonathan was asking about a pet peeve, and, th and this is where you let him know about um, oh, the temperature. About the... Uh, oh, <laughs> well, actually, funny that sh they should be separated from us right now. Do not come for either of us, stay on your side. <laughs> do I only, need... Do I, I'm ready. <laughs> the only pet peeve we have on set, really, and the only time we, we argue and it's solved within a heartbeat, is those two and their temperature. Oh, oh, temperature. <laughs> um, it's definitely Karamo runs very cold and Bobby runs very, very hot. hot. No, it's also you. You So, he, so here is the thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry I asked this question. Put your mic down. No, you're Put not. Put your mic down. Right you're right. Give, take his mic. He's always, <laughs> he's always super hot. And Jonathan's always wanting to, um, to wear something that may not be as, as seasonally appropriate. Oh. As does Karamo. Karamo's always freezing and he wears a t-shirt and a bonnet. Yeah, that's true. Yes, yes, that's yes. True. Okay, just those three are a nightmare. <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah. also, We're the easygoing ones. For any of my long-haired having people out there, you know what it is when you get very sweaty and your hair is freshly blown dry and you get very sweaty here and then your hair sticks together and you get what I call the dreaded Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> Which is like this triangle of skin that like flashes out if you have your hair parted in the middle or on the side and then he's like, your scalp sticks out and it's just my nightmare to see because it's like, I mean, the writing's on the wall. My, my mom's dad graduated high school with no hair left on his head. Like, I'm living on borrowed time. So that's why, I, <laughs> that's why I get worried about, you know, it's really not the temperature. It's sweating and then the hair sticking together. Yeah. And Tan, if I had a voluminous, thick, gorgeous, you know, quaff like you, <laughs> I, you know, I wouldn't worry I about my about. sweaty forehead, you know? So you don't know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca York? Let's see, we just work through it. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. So Rebecca asks, or she says, Queer Eye highlights the positive in our society and how we can build bridges across difference. And while that's important, it could obscure some of the very real issues that actively affect LGBTQ youth. So in your opinions, what are the most pressing issues for youth in our community and what steps can we especially the members of Congress in the room, I'm pointing at you, Sean Maloney of New York, <laughs> Congressman Takano. Um, what can they take to do better for our youth? Well, I, I think that there's a laundry list, yeah. uh, but to get started, I think, to start it off, if you look at like LGBTQIA youth growing up today, if they felt the assurance and the confidence that their heterosexual and or cisgendered counterparts felt in terms of basic civil rights, because that affects you on a macro level of how you're perceived by society, and also on a personal level of, of what your self-worth is. I so the Equality Act is what he's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, and making sure that this country has, you know, a system in place that, that because, it, depending on the state in this country, you can be fired for all sorts of things. You can not get jobs, you can have discrimination at school, you can, but also I think guns are a huge issue for people in high school in this country, and as among everything else. 
and also I think bathroom bills and the, the targeted discrimination that the transgender community continues to face in this administration and, and how that affects people's education and bathrooms, I think is also a huge issue. So let's all get up, let's get out there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, sorry, I love you guys so much. Hey, you may disagree, but you don't have to leave. Give us an hour and we'll tell you why. You, <laughs> you know, I, I think... <laughs> I think one of the most important things, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, you guys are going into these very conservative homes and you're just kind of ignoring the fact that they have very different political views and they may have voted in a way that really does affect our civil rights. But if we are not visible, it will never change. Mm -hmm. If we are not out there showing those people who may have voted in a, in a way that is very detrimental towards our civil rights, if we're not showing them we are people just like they are, mm -hmm then they aren't thinking about us when they vote and they aren't thinking about people that are different than them and the way their votes affect us. Mm -hmm. So I think our biggest, biggest ally is, is visibility and making sure that we're setting a great example and making sure that we're out there and we're proud and we're showing everyone out there that we are just like everyone else and we deserve the same rights that they do. On that point, a 10, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to be really honest. I'm not as informed on American politics as my counterparts. He's, he's British. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> however, however, the thing that I see uh, that is very pro problematic is that we seem to have a government that doesn't speak out when injustice is committed to, um, against our community. And even if they don't, ch even if this, these laws take a long time to change, I, I don't agree with why it takes so long to change, um, but even if it does take a long time to change, I wish that the current administration would speak out against the hate that's delivered to our people. Um, the problem is our current administration is speaking the hate. That's the uh, no, I, I, I do know, I do know, I do know. Yeah, but if I can understand why uh, you are concerned. I'm so sorry, I, I, I didn't catch your name. Rebecca. But, but I, thank you, sorry. Uh, Rebecca, I see why you're concerned, but I'm, I'm sure you'd feel a lot more confident about uh, the state of this country if you felt like the leadership supported basic human rights. And as long as uh, the people that are in power are in power, uh, I, I, I worry that we're never gonna get the security that we, we should expect, not just hope for, actually expect. Deserve. With this incarnation of, of Queer Eye, you're not in the bubble of LA or the bubble of New York. The first two seasons were in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. This current season. <laughs> which is great. Which it is, was so it's really great. Really oh, I loved it. It's great. <laughs> This current season, season three, is in Kansas City. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kansas City, Atlanta, the South. Um, you know, we're talking about the current administration and what it is or isn't doing, but there are voters in these places who support the president. And I'm just curious, what was it like being Queer Eye, the Fab Five, in red states? I, I personally feel really powerful going to those places. I don't want a queer eye that stays in New York and LA. That, that, that's the low hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned. They, the gays will already not, well hopefully won't hate us for being gay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the liberals who are in those uh, coastal states won't, uh, won't feel the disdain for us that maybe people who haven't had the exposure to us may feel. And so I love going to those kind of states. I love having real conversations with them to say, forget what party you follow, forget the, the, what your opinions on the president, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with us, one of us for a week, and then at the end of the week, tell us that you hate us, because that that is, is, that's not possible. You can't hate, hate us for who we are because we're showing you our humanity. What I loved going back, I grew up in Missouri. Um, I spent 17 years of my life trying to get the hell out of there. I never there thought I'd were. go back. <laughs> but going back actually felt really good because I saw how much it's changed since I was that 17-year-old kid trying to get the hell out of there because I was being persecuted, I wasn't accepted. And to go back now and see how accepted we were, and I mean, granted, it was a little different. We're coming back as, you know, on a TV show, but you, you could see that things have changed. Mm -hmm. And it really gave me hope. And it 
just really drove home the point of the more we are visible, mm -hmm. the more people will accept us. The more people realize, you know, the people's biggest fear is about things that they don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't know, understand. so when they see us more, mm -hmm. they accept us more. I, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> and also, um, also I would say one thing that I've really learned in the last two years is the importance of state legislatures. And one thing that you have... And one thing that I experienced on the ground in Atlanta was like when we got to Atlanta, the John Ossoff and Karen Handel election was going on. And it was like all I could talk about the first like three weeks that I was there because that was, that was like the timing of when it went on. And I think that there was like, I remember talking to an Uber driver when I was on the way to the airport to go shoot Gay of Thrones on, on a weekend. And like no one knew what queer I was. <laughs> But I wasn't trying to name drop that, but no one knew what queer I was then. And so like no one this you know, no one knew that I was talking to them about anything. And I was like, well, who are you voting for on Tuesday? What's going on? And he's like, oh, if I vote, it's, nothing's gonna change. Like if John Ossoff wins or if Karen had what what does it matter to me? This is like a 24-year-old kid, you know, who lives in like downtown Atlanta. I'm like, it matters a lot. Like who this is like important. Like you I want and so the complacency and knowing like who your representatives are now, obviously this was a federal election, but what I also noticed in Atlanta is and this was after we were done filming, but Stacey Abrams, honey, she came so close. <laughs> and there, in the state legislature, we made gains in Georgia, we definitely made gains in Missouri. I mean, look at Cherise Davids, honey, coming out of Kansas, yes. <laughs> and so I think that what we have classically considered to be more like red states, I think that they are changing. I think that the coast, the coast, like our, I think that some people are kind of like going back more into the middle of America and they are kind of migrating out of LA and New York and going back to the cities that maybe they came from and more like aerial coastal centers. So I think that like the hope is not lost on people in Missouri and in Georgia. We have to talk to people. We have to engage with people because like Tan was saying, and this is really Brene Brown line, but it's very hard to hate people up close. Mm -hmm. And I think people that don't know, it's because they just have not been exposed. Mm -hmm. So we have to work really, really hard to get into those uncomfortable places and have those uncomfortable conversations with people because I think that, you know, 2020, it is on the table, y'all. Mm -hmm. Like, we can do this in the Senate, y'all. It's not that hard. We can do it. But you got to be talking to your Uber drivers and talking to the people at your whatever class. You know, everyone, you have to chat about it. Like, it's not that far away. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I know I, I made a mistake. I said Kansas, you, you're in, in Missouri. But Jonathan, I want to pick up on something that you just said. Having those uncomfortable conversations. Have you had... If you had an uncomfortable conversation that didn't make it on air, oh God! Man, it's me, and Jody, me and Jody had a great one about um, uh, minimum sentencing <laughs> in Missouri because <laughs> we were we were in the salon for like a solid eight hours. So we talked a lot about just the injustices. She's a corrections officer as well. So yes, right. that's that's what I oh, meant. Now yeah. that was a yes. fantastic transformation. Yeah. Wow! Thanks. But talk about someone who like. <laughs> Just He's not me. wrong. <laughs> but, that was, but that's someone who I would not think that was a corrections officer would have the same feelings that I have about, like, you know, say the militarization of the police force or, like, the failed war on drugs. And this was actually someone who, when I had, when I was, you know, wheeling and dealing all the things that you know that I wheel and deal about on my Twitter, honey, she actually, like, we weren't that far apart. And I was very surprised by that. Now, obviously, for the things I just said, that's why I was not on the TV show, honey. She's a, uh, a very vacuous conversation we had. <laughs> it was a good one. Sorry, were you, yes. were you surprised that your points of view were similar? Or were you yes, surprised because how because she was an officer at a correctional facility. Was. So I thought I was going to be having, like, I thought I was going to walk out of there looking like Angelica in, in Rugrats. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just going to be like, huh. <laughs> But no, I was pleasantly surprised. We were, very, we were a lot more closely lined than I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. We, the, we film 40, 60 hours a week. Right. And it, the show goes down to 45 minutes. Right. Um, episode two of season one, Corey Waldrop. Or was it episode two? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. three. Um, the police officer. Oh, Bump yes. sign in his yard, make America great again hat in his bedroom. Um, that episode ended up being more about the relationship between him and Karamo. Right. Um, but Corey and I also had a two hour car ride where we talked about the election. And we talked about why he voted for Trump and his reasoning and all his reasoning was incorrect. And I was like, <laughs> you know, it, he, w he was talking about how, you know, he just really does not like how Obama never, ever talked about blue lives. It was only black lives. I was like, where did you get that info? Yes, he does. He absolutely supported the police. You know, he supported everyone who was in the right. Where are you getting this info? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I was like, do you only watch Fox News? And he's like, well, actually, I don't watch Fox News at all. I'm like, where are you getting your info? He's like, oh, just from friends. 
And so, yeah, so I, I got him to really think about where he was getting his info, and he started to educate himself more. Corey has now gotten into local politics, and he is not running as a Republican. Oh. No. And so it, it goes back to the having the uncomfortable conversations where you, you, you've got to listen to people, though. What I did was the, how I got him to open up was I listened. Mm -hmm. So don't go in there telling people your point of view. Listen to them first. Not my strong suit, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine. That's why I just, I'm, I typically, I'm just like, let's do the hair. Like, I'll just show you, like, <laughs> I'll show you, like, you know, that, like, sometimes, like, we're not scary, and you know, I'll just be nice, and, you know, just don't look at my Twitter, but he's very good at, <laughs> he's very good at listening, and, and gently asserting yourself, which I think is great. And I, I well, I want to listen over here yeah. to Anthony. <laughs> so, um, Anthony, did you have a conversation um, that was uncomfortable in any of, in any of the seasons? uncomfortable conversations with me, I tend to, I don't know if it's the fact that I'm, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I'm Canadian, and <laughs> I feel like, I definitely feel like I'm, even though I've been in this country on and off for over 13 years, I still feel like I'm a guest here, and I don't feel like my spot here is very safe. I've heard stories of Canadians who cross the border and then come back and aren't able to come mm -hmm. back because um, of basically being asked who they support or having, um, what's it called? Uh, they're not patrolmen, but they're like custom... Um, border. Ice. Border patrol. Yeah, patrol. Border oh. patrol. Bo <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, not, not yet, but... The um, border patrol. And, and, and I've heard those horror stories, so I tend to tread a little more carefully. The, the conversations personally that would make me a little more comfortable were the main reason why I was so uncomfortable being on the show was talking about my sexuality, which is something that I've always kept um, very close to my heart. It's something that I've shared with loved ones and friends and family, but it's not anything I've ever really spoken about in a public space. Mm -hmm. So if I look back at our time with AJ, for example, um, season one, it was like the fifth, fourth mm -hmm. episode, um, and that was an opportunity where he was sharing so much about his experience and the type of man that he wanted to be or that he thought he should be, the fact that he didn't want to be too, and I'm quoting this, feminine um, in, his, in his clothing choices, I realized like, holy shit, like if he's gonna be sharing so much with me, I have to be willing to do the same. Um, and that's when I was comfortable talking about the fact that I, d you know, it, this didn't make it to the, to the scene as well, but like I actually don't, I've never, I'm sure there's some interview there, maybe somewhere, so I'm gonna watch before I quote myself, but like, I've never actually referred to myself as gay. I've always felt more comfortable as fluid. I've been in more relationships with women. I've been in love with women. And for me personally, it feels like, for, in some way, like it's disrespectful to them if I call myself gay because it means something to those relationships. And that's not a judgment against people who have a label, because I think that if, if that's something that's important to you, then like, power to you, absolutely, but for me personally, it's just, I've always felt more comfortable not having one and just considering myself, fluid's the word of the day, for me. I may change my mind tomorrow, but that's how I feel today, and that's, you know. Fluid. But the point is, like, I don't have to, I don't feel like I have to decide, I just want to continue being myself, and mm -hmm. as my father says, just be humble and don't be a dick, and. <laughs> there's a 12-year-old in the audience, there's a 12-year-old oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you cursed. Twice in that, and then said that, Anthony Perazzi. I'm sorry, I actually swear the least out it's of true. all of us. <laughs> I don't right it was me who told you not and to swear. And it was swear. you. I apologize, um, but yeah. Addison Moore. Where's Addison Moore? What that whole section over there? The power section over there. Addison Moore, 19. What's the best way for someone who is LGBTQ+, to use their platform for queer, trans, and non-binary folks? I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to, you know, talk too much. Um, <laughs> 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 um, I think it's visibility, and for me, like, being visible and speaking to things that affect my community is how I want to use my platform, no matter, like, what the comments are going to say. Like, whether there was, like, three people watching or three million, it, your voice matters. Like, it does not matter how many eyes, like, look at it. It's how true 
where, who asked the question? Like over here. Yeah. Hi. Addison. Yeah. So it's like, so it's like, it matters like how authentic you are to the passion that you're bringing to your platform, because I think that like what everyone was saying, like that brings your humanity to your voice, and it's really you can't be afraid of people up close. Like you're so lovely, you know. Everyone's so lovely. So well. Most people are so lovely, you know? <laughs> um, so I think it's just really staying true to what moves you and makes you feel passionate. And when someone is coming for your people, honey, you get all up on that Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or actually though, sometimes I feel like, yes, Twitter, but also like maybe call your rep, honey. Maybe like get on like trans or, um, trans the Center for Transgender and National Equality, NCTE on, on, on their Twitter, make a little donation, honey. Like, cause also like money, moves things for, no, it does. Mm -hmm. Like we gotta raise money for candidates that are going to make sure that uh, non-binary or non-binary and transgender and queer people are protected. Um, like with the Equality Act. So, <laughs> yes. No? Oh, okay. Well, I wanna um, ask a, a question about um, Jess. And Skyler, I'm going to come back to Jess because I mean, talk about pull pull my heart out. Um, based on your experiences with with your heroes, what help can be provided for displaced LBGTQ youth? I mean, Jess was adopted and kicked out of her home when she was 16 yeah. because she came out. Mm -hmm. um, Skyler, if I remember correctly, is transgender man, yes. mm -hmm. uh, also kicked out. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Tan. Um, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and, uh, and we have um, Equality Utah, who, uh, is a, which is a support system for people who uh, do need the support, and most importantly, um, LGBTQIA youth. And even if they don't have a center themselves, they can put you in touch with resources. And if they have that in Utah, of all places, there's bound to be something similar in every state. So I would suggest that you find the organization in your state um, that can offer you support. But also, the younger generation, you guys have access to Instagram, or you use Instagram more than probably any of, well, maybe not some, some of us. You use Instagram. <laughs> You use Instagram and Twitter a lot. You use Insta handles. That wasn't you. I was actually talking about Bobby. Um, you love you, you love you some social. You love you some social, and that's a good thing. Um, and so uh, I and watched like seven hours of gymnastics videos on my explore page today alone. Um, <laughs> but I'm so sorry. Keep going. Yeah, no, no, you're happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, there's, there's nothing wrong with loving social. It can be a great tool. And and, and by that I mean there are hashtags you can find that, where you will find local support uh, systems, local communities that can truly offer the support that you need so yes social can be vapid and vile but it, social media can actually be a great resource so if you're if you're struggling to find something locally to you it's that it can be just a hashtag away and, and, and there are and, hotlines sorry there are hotlines available as well I think that the mere a human voice somebody to speak to so that you don't feel like you're having this conversation in your own Trevor head, so project Trevor, yeah. Trevor project <laughs> National Ooh. Suicide Hotline, if that's something that, that can apply to somebody, which is on my Instagram account, I'm keeping yeah. it up there. But and like, you know, if you are one of those youth who are lucky enough to have parents who are amazing and love you no matter what and accept you no matter what, find those local LGBTQ plus places where kids who aren't as lucky as you have to go. Go there, volunteer, <laughs> donate clothes you've grown out of, give back to them because you were lucky enough to have parents that love you. You know, help them. You literally reach out. And so that gets to that gets to the main theme of, of Queer Eye is love yourself. Yeah. And so how do you then say to teens who are going through it emotionally, how do you connect with them to let them know that not only speaking of Trevor Project, it gets better, which is a future message, but that they can get through this which is a here and now message. So for me, having gone through those type of situations, it does get better. And the way I show them and tell them is, I went through a lot. I went through, did things that I am not proud of to survive, to make it through, but every single thing that I went through has made me the person that I am today. It did not kill me, it made me stronger and it will make you stronger. You will get through it, it will get better. 
you know, everything that you go through in life is what makes you the person that you are. And none of it is bad. You know, so hang in there, stay strong. The more you go through, the stronger you'll be and the more successful you'll be. I, uh, <laughs> I used to see this um, positive affirmations as a very American concept. Uh, the, Brits are very, <laughs> the Brits are very cynical. We really are, we're cynical people. Um, and uh, we, we truly, no, they know we truly Shining are. example, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've been in America for a few years now and, um, and I started practicing positive affirmations for myself uh, a, a few years ago. And it really does help. Uh, the, Wow. <laughs> what is your positive affirmations, I don't, I don't share them with you, but let me tell you why. How dare you not share your positive affirmations? <laughs> because it's a very personal thing, Jonathan. Personal. Private. He, he must you have know, a positive... He stands in the mirror as he's brushing his hair. No, but he must... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue into letting you continue finish your thought. Yes. <clears throat> he must have a pos positive affirmation because out of all of us, Tan has the ability to show up on set no matter what is troubling him in That's life. True. Or anything that he's That's going true. Through, he shows up with his chin up and a smile That's on his true. face. That's true. He's always true. a professional. So professional. Yes. So I want to hear about this. <laughs> Thanks. That is true. Thanks. <laughs> okay, can I tell you what it is? Yeah. Please, yes, you, might, uh, you, yes. uh, you might make no, fun we of won't, me. We won't, no, no, we won't. No, we won't. Sit here while I tell it. I don't want to um, okay, so here, try this. This is going to sound... Oh my God, I feel like we're bringing Karamo, we're invoking Karamo into the room. We right are. Because you have a call and repeat, a self-affirmation. No, no, it's not, it's, it's not call and repeat. Oh, okay, never so, mind. I started doing this a few years ago, and here's the thing. <laughs> there are so many uh, people coming at us constantly who have something negative to say, especially on social media. The amount of times I would see on social media something just negative. The trolls are always out there. They're, they're really fighting that fight. And so I thought, well, <laughs> I, I want to do something where I'm feeling better about myself. And so every day, funnily, funnily enough, you mentioned when I'm brushing my hair, that's not when I do it. But I, when I brush my teeth, that takes me about two minutes. And if it doesn't take you two minutes, you're doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> That's true. That is true. So I, I, I... Some brushes have timers these days. They do. It's exactly they do. how long you should be brushing. And so whilst I'm brushing my teeth, I do it in my underwear. And I, shh, I do Wait, it in what? my underwear. And I do it in my underwear for a reason. I he doesn't use... want to get toothpaste on his shirt. No, let me feel it, you guys. Uh, the reason... <laughs> Shut up. The reason why I do it this way is because it gives me time to look at myself and really say, these are the things I love about myself physically, and these are the things that I love about myself emotionally. And... And, and so then it sets me up for the day, no matter what happens in the day, no matter what somebody says, some, uh, says to me, if they say something vulgar, if they say something racist, if they say something homophobic, I just think, well, at least there's these things that I love about myself. At least I'm finding every opportunity to make myself happy, as opposed to just accepting the hate that's thrown my way. I would never make fun of that teeny. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it sets it, try it, it sets you up for the day. When you first do it, you're gonna think, oh my gosh, I feel cheesy as fur. But then after that, <laughs> you get used to it, and That's I promise, safe. yeah. And it honestly, it really can make you feel better. That, I say this a lot, but I don't wanna be the reason I'm unhappy, and so I allow mm -hmm. myself to compliment myself at the start of the day. Wow. Beautiful. I don't wanna be the reason I'm I unhappy. won't be the reason I'm, I am, why I'm unhappy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's like get out of your own way sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love that, Tanny. I can't believe you never told me you did positive affirmations. Uh. I didn't want you to think I'd change so much that I'd become American. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you are you're literally in, in a room you're of what I assume to be capital. almost all Americans. I'm married an American, I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it works, but okay. <laughs> right, that, that, that is true. Um, <laughs> All right, I don't have a last name. Oh, good. Uh, some Jackie, people, some people 24. Jackie. <laughs> it's only one Jackie, hi. Th thanks, Jackie, 24. When, when you felt lost or stuck in life, what helped you move forward? Anthony. Well, Celine Dion. Me. <laughs> there goes my answer. Uh, uh, I think when I was the most lost in my life was probably when I was in, it's kind of like this pre-college, so it was my early 20s. Um, I was back in Montreal. I was studying commerce. Um, no shade to anybody who loves commerce, but I still can't fully explain what that major was. 
And, um, and I was really, I, I was very unhappy, had no direction, no idea what it was that I wanted to pursue in my life. And, um, and there was a teacher. Um, his name is uh, Victor Garraway, and he was my um, English teacher. And he called me into his office one day, and he basically looked over my grades and basically told me, we started chatting about like, what I wanted to do with my life. And, um, and he became a mentor. And then I used to go see him sometimes unannounced once or twice a week just to check in, sometimes just to hang out, and other times just to like silently read a book for 20 or 30 minutes and just to like be around him. And um, he ended up actually getting me in touch with a social worker who got me in touch with a psychologist. And um, what was the question? Yeah, but, <laughs> I was like, I think you got off track, like, babe. What was, what, was, what was the question? It was during a dark time in our life that we did. I have a point. I have a point. I have a point. You're going to loop it I back wouldn't, I, I wasn't ready to admit it to myself, and I don't even know if I figured it out at the time, but I needed help. And my parents weren't available for that help. And so I went to a teacher. And I've realized now that all throughout my life, whether I was in high school or even in university, I've always sought out mentors through teachers that would actually listen to me, that, that I respected. Um, so I think during like all of the darkest periods of my life, I always, one thing, I did a lot of things wrong, but one thing that I did right is that I didn't keep it from myself too long, because it comes back to what I was saying previously, about when you have that conversation in your own head, it starts to become a problem. Mm -hmm. And by actually reaching out to somebody and getting some professional help in the end was the best thing that I could have ever done for myself, and it's something I continue to do to this day. Yeah. So. I came back. <laughs> I got ADD, but it comes back. back. It comes back. I can balance it out. It was how we uh, get through those hard times. And, uh, what helped you move forward when you oh my lost gosh. or stuck? Mine's more sinister. <laughs> Yours was beautiful. <laughs> and a true reflection of your personality now. Yeah. This is a true reflection of mine. Revenge. <laughs> <Dear God>. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well. Here's the thing. I was not meant to have the life that I have now. I was raised in a very strict, very, very, very strict community and household. And I was told that this was not a life that was okay for me. And every day I encouraged myself to prove my worth and show that I can have the life that I want to have and be incredibly successful. One of the most successful people in my community. And I will prove it one day. And so that, honestly, that drive got me through Every day, every time I was feeling shitty about myself, I thought these people are trying to thwart me. That's the motivation that got me through, thinking I will prove my worth. I'm gonna do one real Sinister. quick. I'm gonna answer real quick. 20 seconds or less, I swear. Okay. <laughs> Love you too. Was that a brown person that said that? <laughs> yeah! You know that all too well. You know it. <laughs> if you find yourself in a really dark, like prolonged dark uh, rut, as I have often, um, doing something that I was passionate about, like has always created a thread that has like created every success and every moment of happiness that I've like ever had. So whether that passion was like helping people or learning to figure skate or whatever, like it's, it's been yoga for a long time. It was honestly like growing up in a rural town, like being like mercilessly bullied, like it was cheerleading. Like that was what, like that was like a group of people that was like, oh my God, like I, like if I hurl myself backwards, like those girls will protect me. So, <laughs> so like it was, but I was passionate about learning how to cheer. So it's like whatever you're passionate about learning to do, that will put like one foot in front of the other to get you out of that dark yeah. ride. Jonathan, since you brought it up and I was going, my next question was going to come to you about bullying, but since you brought it up, um, you've long talked, you've talked before about the fact that you've never fully experienced being in the closet, that you've been, you have been bullied as a result of it. How did you cope with it? For the LGBTQ plus kids and maybe even some adults, how do you deal with the bullying? How do you cope with it? Um, great question. Um, I think that when I was young growing up, it was a lot of uh, watching figure skating, watching gymnastics and eating Pop-Tarts and praying for it to be over. Um, honestly, and I think what I've realized as an adult, because kind of having this success in this, in this public eye, as Tan was talking about, has also like brought its fair amount of like criticism and bullying and, and 
you know, kind of a, like, I'm like, oh, there you are again, um, but so much more intense than it was uh, feeling in junior high. But the feeling of bullying is, like, awful, whether it's on this scale or whether, like, I was 14. Yeah. Um, and I think what really has gotten me through is, the first thing I was saying earlier tonight is, like, the relationship with myself. Like, that is the only thing we come into this world with, and it's the only thing you leave with. And everything else is, like, not that it's not, it's important, but it's, mm -hmm. you have to have a really strong relationship with yourself and know that none of this is permanent. Mm -hmm. The success isn't permanent. The not success isn't permanent. Like your love isn't, I mean, nothing is permanent. I, I hate to break it to you, but it's true. And can I add to that also, Jonathan, is you would, uh, sorry, we did, I don't think we fully asked, answered your question, Jonathan, earlier. <laughs> sorry. sorry. I don't think we fully <laughs> answered your question earlier. Will you concentrate, please? Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, you were asking about loving yourself, and, uh, and I, I think that we, we need to add in one more thing uh, about that. I, so many times we see on our show that people don't take care of themselves because they think there's some shame in loving yourself or showing yourself love. They feel like it's selfish, and so I think it's important what you say, but to also add in that loving there's no shame in accepting that you love facets of yourself, parts of yourself, and encourage those and, 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 and allow them to flourish. Um, so many times we see on our show when people just feel like they can't show themselves uh, love, they can't practice self-care because it's selfish. There's, there's nothing selfish well, about that. For vanity or yeah, exactly. But getting through to how I dealt with bullying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just knowing that it's not permanent and your relationship with yourself is really so important. And as I've experienced this success, I've met so many people who I've really looked up to my entire life. And what I've realized is, is that you're no different than, I'm no different than you, you're no different than me. Like the people that we've looked up to and read about, President Obama, um, <laughs> everyone, everyone that, that we really look up to, like they have insecurities, they have all sorts of stuff. And I think that it's really helpful to know that Jonathan at 32 is insecure and worried about things just the way that I was when I was 14. Like everyone is, we're all going through the same thing and it's really not permanent. So if you're being bullied and you're in a bad situation now, it will not last forever. Like find your obsession with guinea pigs or figure skating or whatever <laughs> it is for you and like just Say chase that pigs. down as much as you can <laughs> until you can leave the bad situation that you're in. Bobby? Yes. What's, what's your, um, your fascination, your obsession? If his is figure skating, what's yours? Penny. I mean, ranch dressing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's my, web, my Midwest crew. We had the most beautiful, <laughs> I'm sorry, we had the most beautiful, beautiful pizza. pizza today, wood burning oven, real burrata, Gorgeous. San Marzano tomatoes, Ooh. the most airy, fluffy leaves of basil, and this one's like, I want a bowl of ranch. <laughs> <laughs> it was a food rant. You didn't miss anything. Um, now or growing up? Like growing up, honestly, I put my passion into music. I love to sing. I loved being in band. Kind of that's a lot of times where us queer kids end up, you know, because everybody is so accepting and loving no matter who you are, what you are. Um, now my passion is really the environment. Um, you know, I'm the one going around on set making sure stuff is recycled and, you know, making sure we're not wasting electricity. If we, if we don't stop what we're doing to our planet, literally nothing else matters. So for me, it's, it's the environment. That's my passion. Ali Steinberg, American University Pride. Oh, is that good? There you are. That's a fantastic name. Age 20. When oh, doing, don't tell her age. She wrote it down. <laughs> when doing so much it's emotional. It's our age. <laughs> when doing emo, so, pay attention. Do, when doing so much <laughs> emotional <laughs> labor for hey, people on the show. This is the best behavior we've ever been on. on a really? Panel. Are you yes. serious? Yes. yes. Oh, God, yes. Wow. We're actually doing really well. Yes. You are? Yes. Because I'm getting a workout out <laughs> of here. Lord. Okay. I'm sorry. As you so were. here's Ali. Ali Steinberg, age 20, American University Pride. When doing so much emotional labor for people on the show, how do you leave enough time and emotional energy for yourselves and your families? Which is a question I wonder after every tear-soaked episode I've watched. When I figure it out, I will get back to you, honestly. I'm, my yeah. cats are exhausted. I'm exhausted. <laughs> All these people are exhausted up here. We're really, I'm just kidding. It's, 
it, like for me, it's like a pocket of joy. Like it used to be that like my old minimum of like recouping after doing like 12 people's hair in the salon that day, like four days in a row, was like go home, order like something gorgeous from Postmates and like don't leave for like until Monday. You know, like Saturday, Sunday, Monday, like just like rest. Now that pocket of alone time is from like, you know, it's Eight like three weeks, hours like instead yeah. of like, you know, a weekend. Like it's just shorter. So I got to condense it, honey. It's like bath, YouTube figure skating, lay with cat, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Yoga. <laughs> what about you? I'm actually, it's easier to answer like the things that used to bring me joy before that I long for now. Mm. That I like kind of fantasize while I'm filming. No. Oh. I didn't realize that we were going to go in this direction. No. <laughs> no, can you just A stick with the self-care? fantasy does not have to be sexual. But can you just... That's not what I was but thinking. But stick with your self-care. Like, you have so much No, but like self-care. The self, uh, self-care for me is like, actually sitting down and reading a book. Or, or like listening down. to... Or that what? <laughs> or, like, or just sitting yeah. down. Or just yeah, sitting down. You've got other ones that, you're, that are really good self-care. Which... Oh, bath. I'm a Pisces, and I love a bath. The bath is probably... <laughs> but, but please try to take one, like, only at the most once a week. It wastes a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't a bath better than a shower? Or is it not? I don't know. Oh. Honestly, that whole plastic thing, I was so scared of him. That, that straw with the whole straw thing, honey. Oh, my God. You can be like, great to oh, the environment wait. in many ways, but I think yes, a bath for me is very important. Serious. Just to so kind serious. of, like, float and have my you. salts. I listen to my records. <laughs> yes. That's another really big how one. How long do you soak? I stay there, uh, I get super pruny. I, stay, pruny. I can stay like an hour. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, I was gonna say, that's about an hour. A solid hour. hour. When it starts to get really cold, that's when it's time to get out. Oh, you don't add water? No, that's oh. much too wasteful. In, in Japan, our bathtubs self-regulated its heat. Okay. Yes, but when it would people cool who down aren't in Japan. Up, it was amazing. <laughs> I just like burnt myself so badly in that bathtub. I could not figure it out at all. My Google Translate would not work on the button because it was too curved. <laughs> Honey, I was just scorched. I just, 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 wow. I, but it, they were electric, honey. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm sorry, I just want to say numbers, one more thing. Like Anthony. Uh, not necessarily from like after ending an episode, but just with where life has come to where we get to experience incredible nights like this where we get to share our stories and everything the time spent with family like my family I've neglected so much since the show that came out and that's one of the sacrifices about having a life like this is that when I have five minutes to just even check in with my sister and I used to feel guilty so I'd stopped calling her for a while and what I realize now is that even if I call her and I'm like I literally have three minutes I'm in a car I'm about to get out but I just wanted to call you and tell you that I love you now tell me about all like the medical issues that your cat's having and how like (laughs) diaper issues with the kid or whatever like just let me tell me tell me normal things um, so, yeah, little pockets like that to actually connect with loved ones. Ten. Uh, again, we're, we're, we have a common theme. We only have very, very little time. Um, we're usually away from our loved ones. I'm away from my husband a lot. Um, but what brings me so much joy is being at home. I actually am doing the thing that you were doing before the show. If I have three days off, I will sit on my sofa with my husband. I will... It's true, because you always Insta-story it when you do it. Yeah, I do, I do. I will cook the food. I love to cook. Like, I, I love, love, love to cook and bake. And so I will spend the majority of my day in the kitchen and then sit on the couch and sit with my husband. I don't want to talk to anyone else. I just want to watch... You love a hike, too, like nature. Is I love a hike, love but it's self-care. hard to do these Can wears Tevas willingly. I do. <laughs> you guys, I am so what? granola when I'm in Utah. Willingly. You would have no idea. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's shocking. So granola. Uh, Bobby, I want you to get in on, on that question, and then I have a, because we have five minutes, and I have a lightning round. It, well, kind of. It has been hard. Season one and season two, I, there were many nights where I just would come home and cry, mm-hmm. because it was so emotionally overwhelming. The connections that you see us make with our heroes are real. Mm-hmm. And again, they're 40 to 60 hours of connections that are condensed down for you guys for 45 minutes. So there was a lot I had to work out with myself of my own feelings and how to deal with that emotions that I had tucked away for so many years. But I find that keeping myself tethered to the things that I did before, you know, making sure I'm spending time with my husband, the hikes, you know, the, the spending time with friends that have been there for me and family, you know, and if your family's not there, your, your friends that are your family. Yeah. You know, spending time and making sure that you're making those moments for the people that you love the most, mm-hmm. that's how you keep grounded. And 
And like you also it. love Orange yeah. Theory. You also love to do some like physical activity. That keeps you, you he it's does. True. It's true. <laughs> he does. Uh, okay, <laughs> since, <laughs> since, um, okay. This, what I want from each of you, and I'm gonna say this now so that you can think of your answer, but at the end of the show, there's always the QE is hip tip, uh -huh. right? Yes. So I want you each to give your hip tip. Mm. Um, maybe one that has been on the show, preferably one that hasn't been on the show. And I'm gonna start with you, Jonathan. Do you just like want like a, just a hip? Green, green stick. And, and, do, and just explain to you what green stick is? I'm sorry, I was like zoning out. <laughs> <laughs> Give a little on, on the fly hip tip. Uh, on the fly, yeah, on, on the, the fly, fly hip tip. tip. That you have I've got it, if you need a minute, I've got it. Yeah, you go to Okay, go okay to 10. Uh, the items in your closet that you're saving for special occasions, why are you saving those special occasions? Don't you want to feel special every day? And so, oh. Wear that ball gown to work. <laughs> my issue is, my issue is, when is the queen actually inviting you over for tea? Probably never. So use that, <laughs> use that tea dress for another occasion. Tanny, you've invited me over good. for tea. I figured mine out. I figured mine oh, out. Okay. okay. Oh, wait, what? Wait, wait, where are you? Does this mean I can wear my prom dress to class? Yeah. What, what? Wear your what? You can wear your prom, dress, prom gown to class. You if know, it makes, if you, it happy, makes you feel good, it can't be yes. that bad. Cheryl Crow. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do right, I'm Jonathan. gonna do my hip tip, but I just pretend that this is a hair color box, okay? <laughs> Thinking about doing a box color at home? Don't. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> because the nine dollars you spend now is gonna stay in your hair for the four years while you grow it out. Your wallet and everyone around you will say thank you so much, put it down, and walk away from the hair color aisle. True. <laughs> that would be mine. That would be mine. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, because also, too, because really, you guys, literally, this is like not a wives' tale, and it's really true. And I've done so many fugly highlights because people lie. <laughs> Once your hair has had hair color on it, it is in there. It's not, oh, it was four months ago, it's gone. No, it's not. Four months is about this far down your head, okay? <laughs> So if, like my hair, like my length right here, that's like three years of hair. So you need to think about that. <laughs> if you do not have money for your whatever, we're getting- Hip tips are usually 30 you seconds. Do, but yeah. I'm just saying you don't want to have that root and that permanent line of demarcation. It's a nightmare. It's like expensive to get rid of it and then you're It's going it. to the next episode yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you okay. still watching? <laughs> Jonathan, Bobby. Um, for me, my hit tip when people always ask, how should I design my home? What are the trends? You know what? Screw trends. Find the one item that you love and build from that because if that item really brings you joy, as Marie Kondo would say, that's a pretty good inclination that it's, it's a design direction you should yes. go in. Find the item you love and go from there. It's Bobby's one item policy, honey. I love it. <laughs> it's how I decorated my house. <laughs> it, his me. one item was a picture of me. And he Decorated around it. It was cat stuff, but yeah. Hey. <laughs> Anthony. <laughs> Anthony. So I'm kind of thinking of our, our special 12 year old girl who's here. Don't um, swear, yes. And Sally. Sally. Stand up and have a little hand, honey. Stand up. Where's Sally Morgan? Sorry to call you out. Sorry, I'm not sorry. I just sorry. love a twelve-year-old who asks questions. Sorry. But like, yes. Is it advice for her? Th thinking, but no, because thinking about what it was like when I was twelve years old. I was living in West Virginia, and I used to bring these lunches to school. And my mother would take great pride and care in, in making lunch. Sally, and there is the always camera, somebody the camera, distracting. Get a selfie, girl. Get it. Come here, Sally. Oh my gosh, it's happening! It's happening. She could have tripped. You ran there. Hi, you can sit here. Hi, Sally. <laughs> Hello, Sally. Sally came Hi, Sally. to play today. I've been chugging on a cold brew, so I apologize for my breath. Man's <laughs> used to it. Um, but I think back about like what it was like being 12 when I was in West Virginia, and I would see the difference between the kids who had lunches and the kids who didn't. And I remember how much it affected me. And it was only like 
10 or 15 years later that I started thinking about it and thinking like, I had the opportunity to actually give whether it was half of my sandwich or half of my meal, and I didn't do that. And I thought about it, but I was too embarrassed to do it when I was 12 years old. And these kids often like, if they didn't have a lunch at school, I can only imagine what they had or didn't have for breakfast or dinner. So if you're in a position where you can share your food with somebody, you, 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 will, you may never know like, what effect you'll have on their lives, but I think it's a really important thing to do. Yeah, okay, thank so, you. And All right. that, share your food. Thank you. thank you for coming to say hi to us. I'll hug you, I'll hug you, I'll hug you. Thank you. Thank you. And Come with on. that, thank you all. Thanks, Sally. And that's a great way to end this. Thank you, guys. Jonathan, oh. Bobby, Anthony, Tam. Where I thank you so much. Thank you, Jonathan, for putting up with us. <laughs> thank you. So much fun. It was really fun.